Although a couple of, uh, of thousands of miles apart right now, I <laughs> assume you must be in your house in Venice Beach. And uh, it's kind of a Gesamtkunstwerk, what we can see in the background. It looks like the, the most lovely studio I've seen in, in TV in all my life. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, where you're at and what we see through the camera? Well, yeah, um, right now I'm, I'm at my house in Venice, uh, Venice Beach. And um, it's, a, it's a, a house that I made for myself um, uh, a few years back, about a, dec a decade ago, actually. And um, I was kind of living in this tiny, tiny house. It was uh, made from the 1920s. And it was, um, it was a worker's house when this entire peninsula was sand dunes with oil wells. And um, anyways, I lived there for a very long time and eventually the house started collapsing in on itself, literally. And I had an idea to make an artwork uh, titled House where I um, brought my mother and father down to this house. And um, we filmed over 10 days when we uh, destroyed the house around them. Um, the glass shattering, the chimney collapsing, the walls um, cascading down. And um, the final scenes of the work is um, just a bare dirt lot. And um, so that, that was it's kind not of- not um, the house where you were raised, actually. No, or it's was not it the house, house where you were no. no, no, this is just a, a place by, I've lived here for, for probably 20 years or so. And um, so after I, I made this work where the, the house was destroyed and it went back to the earth, um, <laughs> it's a kind of funny story, but I realized I had to do something quickly because I was kind of squatting at my studio. Um, I had nowhere to live. So I, I kind of designed this space. And, um, and what happened really was kind of every decision became the same kind of problem solving that you would apply to an artwork. Um, I almost was naive. I almost didn't know better. But I thought, you know, why, why would we uh, go buy a table if we could make a table that could be a musical instrument that we could play? We'll just make it ourselves. So it kind of one thing led to another and, and the house became kind of a living installation um, and uh, installation to be lived in. So um, that's where I'm at today. <laughs> so basically the table behind you is a, is a xylophone. Probably most of the viewers have seen at some point performances yeah. that took place in your house and where the table can be also played as an instrument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In fact, actually, the whole house can be performed. Um, inside the, uh, the concrete foundation of the house, uh, we sank a number of geological microphones, and they go into um, a cabinet where there's a mixing board. So you could uh, turn on a switch, and you could turn on the entire house, and the house will hear the earth below it. Or you can go to the stairs, and each single step has a microphone inside it. So they can be tuned uh, to be different um, pitches so you can perform the stairs if you want to or you know a lot of times friends of mine who make music come over and you know we have dinner and they end up um, creating a song out of the architecture it's fantastic and i really like also that you let grow nature inside the house like certain elements are modernistic like the the windows on on the corner of the house you know which is kind of something that modern architecture brought into game. But on the other hand, you have like this nature, which was almost the enemy of modernist architecture, or it had to stay outside. And you actually applied it as a seal screen on the wall. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, behind me, the walls, uh, you know, kind of surrounding me in, in this little room um, are um, photographs of the trees outside, the hedges directly outside the window. And um, we turned them into a photo silk screen and hand silk screen the walls. And um, once again, it was just an experiment, kind of a, a very personal private experiment. But I was interested if I could create a condition where at moments of time, when the light comes through the glass, the, uh, the chroma and the saturation of the walls inside match the exterior exactly. And kind of the line between um, form and structure and, and the natural environment kind of merges. I really like this little introduction because we speak about a physical space that you inhabit right now. And I think everything else is so abstract. We speak uh, to each other through Zoom, you know, which has become the, the predominant way to, to communicate and also to have talks in the cultural world. And uh, we are in different time zones on different continents. And I think it's very interesting still to have like this kind of... Uh, 
physical uh, environment that can be described and that can be touched in your case. And it's really interesting to speak to you because I think on one hand, of course, the title of this talk on art and participation and uh, you, you, you brought it to an, another level, like how you can participate with creative minds and how you can build a network actually to create artworks. And I'm very much looking forward to speaking to you more about this. But on the other hand, I think you're also always bringing in uh, central experiences uh, in, in your work where, where you see uh, elements, where you experience elements in, in an intensity that you haven't before. And I, I think today, you know, I mean, I still know that some of your artworks are accessible and it's possible even to visit them with social distancing. For example, Mirage in Gstaad in Switzerland, that people can still access and I think they can still have this experience of, of seeing the landscape and distorting the landscape and dissolving actually uh, physical space. But in general, I think we are all deprived of sensory uh, adventures. Or it's, we, we live in, in a very poor environment somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's really interesting to look at your work, you know, and, and, and that, that I looked at, at your films again and that, that I could really sense like how much I was missing all these elements and, and all these experiences, also all this social interactivity. But I'm very honored to welcome you tonight. And I mean, you are one of the most important voices in contemporary art today. You relentlessly push the envelope of what art can be or what art should be. I think you're always open to change. And I think it, it's going to be also interesting to hear from you if you have been changed into, in the perception of, of the world and the art world, and if it's going to change your, your art practice. And you always open new doors of perception and sensory experiences. Most of your artworks deal with structures and systems rather than objects. And it's always about the complexity also of today's reality and how it can be experienced and how it can be made into a system or a systemic experience. I also really admire like how you, you go beyond a medium that you go into film and installations to architectural interventions to uh, diving, to flying, to riding, to, to speed, like the perception of speed. I think it's, it's very interesting how flexible your artwork is in its nature. And of course, for you, it's like a homecoming because we're still at, at the Hirshhorn, although virtually at the Hirshhorn, and, and you really change the perception of that building. I think forever, and uh, someone is in the collection of the Hirshhorn. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very big endeavor to reactivate is, it, and we are working on it, but it's going to take some more time. But of course, everybody really wants to see someone again in DC. And people, somebody described actually the frustration when the projector went off the last time, and the morning actually of of the end of it, that this glow, you know, and this life that emitted from the building was gone. So very briefly, just about your, your biography, you were born in Redonda Beach, California in 1968. I guess this is a magical combo between a place and, and time, a, a, very, a very special place and a very special time. And you went to the Art Center College of Design, where you studied also illustration and also to Marymount College in Palos Verdes. You had your first solo show at AC Project Room in New York in 1993. And the same year you were in a group show, OK Behavior, at 303 Gallery, that was curated by one of its installers named Gavin Brown. And I guess that was your beginning of, of, uh, of a very long collaboration with 303 Gallery. Since then, uh, your work has been featured in, in numerous exhibitions around the world at the Whitney Museum, the MoMA, the Vienna Secession, the Serpentine Gallery in London, Centre Pompidou in Paris. You participated in the 1997 and 2000 Whitney Biennial. You received the 2012 Nam June Pike Art Center Prize, the 2013 Smithsonian Magazine American Ingenuity Award, Visual Arts. 
and you also received the Americans for the Arts National Arts Award and you were the, the first recipient of the Frontier Art Prize. So it's great to have this opportunity to speak to you. And first I want to ask you, how has this, this COVID reality changed your perception of the world and more specifically of the art world? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that question for all of us is so pertinent. And, um, you know, I think on, on personal level for myself, you know, I found myself suddenly um, slowing down and finding patterns and finding repetition. And, you know, I think that idea that suddenly you are where you are, you're kind of in the moment, whatever place you are, you kind of find yourself almost looking at the details, looking at the definition of that place, as opposed to, I think it's very easy for us as a society to become very obsessed with um, what hasn't happened, the future and a sense of past, but for us to divorce ourselves from the present. And, um, I think that's, that's, that for me has been one of the, the kind of fascinating things about this, this um, period of the last six months. And, um, you know, we find ourselves uh, restricted and limited, but also I think that we can find, um, we can find something within that. We can find a sense of reflection, a sense of ourselves, a sense of um, perhaps looking at our society in a different way, in a way that we're not kind of part of this acceleration, this kind of incredible speed but instead you know we can take stock on what is of value to each and every one of us and you know what we want in our lives and what we want to edit out and um, I think for, for me that's true both in life and in art and I'm not quite sure really if there's a separation between the two um, for myself but I think that one of the things also that that we was very interesting to me is <clears throat> every time we have a conversation you know you and I spoke a week ago or something, and the conversation inevitably leads to, you know, what have you seen lately? What films have you watched? Have you read a book? Have you um, listened to music? Have you heard any fantastic music? And all these things that we find ourselves leaning on during this COVID period is culture. We're looking at culture because it's one of the things that elevates us. It separates us. It, it's a nutrient that we can absorb. And um, I think that's incredibly interesting and valuable. I totally agree. But I mean, still, you work in a workshop, like even you, you called your company the Doc Aitken Workshop. So it's, that's a very communal approach to yeah. creating work already, like even if, in, your, in your headquarter. Have you been able to create like new work, despite the fact that you were not able to, to have your regular routine? Yeah, we had a very uh, kind of um, interesting kind of um, epiphany, a kind of moment around April. And um, I was at my studio and I've been thinking about this subject a lot, you know, kind of how do you produce during a COVID period where there is these kind of you know, very severe restrictions and parameters on what you can create and how you can create and how you can collaborate. Um, you know, so I, I kind of met with everyone that I work with. I said, I said, you know, starting now, we're just going to rotate 180 degrees. And we're not going to focus on physical things, on objects, on anything like that. We just erase it. And moving forward, what we can do is we should focus on visions, on hallucinations, on dreams, on projects that just don't exist. They can't exist. Um, and we'll find a way to make them exist. And we'll put all of our energy, I'll put my, my energy into, into writing and, and flushing out these ideas, drawing them, rendering them, um, making them, making something that's, that's, that's intangible, visible, and, and trying to make these projects real. And, um, and it became a very kind of interesting journey. It was, uh, it was very much a struggle at first because you, you know, I, I just found myself kind of obsessively working on these projects that, you know, that had, um, you know, they had no home, <laughs> they have no support, no production. They're simply kind of a, like a, a pulse in your mind that you're trying to put on paper. And, you know, I would work for, you know, 12 hours a day or 15 hours a day sometimes trying to develop these things, which, you know, on, on one hand could from the outside almost seem completely meaningless. And over time, as the months evolved, um, these projects started to become more real. They started to become more, um, I could see them, we could talk about them, we could, we could look at how they could exist and where they could exist. And, 
you know, in a strange way, you know, some of these projects are starting to become real now as we speak. And I think that one of the things I've learned from this, this, um, you know, kind of strange situation that I was in, this kind of odd practice, this kind of exercise, was it was about, it was about creativity. And it was really about this idea that, that it's very easy to put self-imposed parameters on oneself and to say, you know, maybe does art have to exist within architecture? Does it have to exist within a gallery or a museum? Does art have to exist physical at all? Or can art be other things? Can, it, can we expand it into another realm of, of frequencies? And to me, that's incredibly inspiring because I think the possibility- Can you make an of, example of possible frequencies of the future? Well, I think, um, I think we can look at that maybe in two ends of the spectrum, for example. We can look at that in the physical world, the landscape around us, um, the sky, the ocean, the earth urban spaces that are dense and packed can be transformed as much as um, an empty vacant space, a desert, a mountainside. Um, and, but I think on the other end of the spectrum, we can also look at the dematerial. We can look at um, mediums like sound. We can look at um, the web. We can look at digital platforms. Um, you know, I think right now we're kind of undergoing an absolute revolution in the moving image. You know, it's very interesting if we look back in the history of the moving image, um, you know, from, you know, Lumiere brothers to kind of early cinema to this kind of sense of, of, of you know, Godard, Truffaut, Bergman, uh, Fellini, kind of stretching the narrative structure of cinema. And I think at a certain point, you know, maybe uh, 10, 20 years ago, that, that elasticity of cinema kind of reached its end. It kind of, the experimentation kind of reached a certain end point where the experimentation and innovation became less. And then all of a sudden something happened, which was we started looking at time in a different way. We were allowing ourselves to look at short bursts of information on our phones. We were able to look at long episodic pieces of cinema, like a, a Breaking Bad or something like that that goes on for 30, 40 hours. And I think within that, in the last decade or so, we've seen this revolution in the time code, the breaking of the time structure. And that also, on the other end of the spectrum, if one side is the intensely physical world. On the other side, I think that dematerial realm has opened up incredible possibilities for um, art making. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting introduction. And I think it's the perfect base to dive into the first artwork that I picked, Station to Station, a work from 2013. And uh, what was really amazing for me is to see that a contemporary artist can do a new artwork that is based on a train ride. So actually it was a train ride from the Atlantic to the Pacific over 23 days in September, 2013. And they were constantly changing group of creative contributors joined and they took part in 10 events in major cities. So there were uh, musicians, uh, visual artists, uh, filmmakers, um, experts of all kinds. And I would like just to look quickly at uh, what is always very difficult with your work, especially the work that is based on participation is how to document it. And I mean, it's a, it's a very short clip that at least makes it a little bit more justice than a, a still image, but it's still, I think, impossible to, to bring over all the energy that was unloaded during that project. But let's look at this clip now. I always admire the train, uh, this kind of train with the panorama window, uh, which is an incredible perception to it. Every moment is different with this project and every happening is different. This is not a tour, it's not a package, it's not a system. It's something which is ever changing. Turning thinking into doing, you make a work of art. Where does an idea come from? When you see a gesture, you're supposed to know what it means. No, you don't. It depends on who you are, where you are, and where you're standing. We're not these closed systems. We exist as microcosms, universes.
Yeah. So he came later to the Parbican, but it was it was really made for a train, actually. And maybe you can yeah. talk a little so, bit more um, about the train as a form, a very special form of road trip or of of uh, rail trip. Yeah. So, um, well, Station to Station was it was for me it was a fascinating project, and it came out of uh, a certain kind of restlessness that I had. I, I felt that at that moment. Um, culture was being siloed, it was being segregated, and it was being segregated by um, commercial structures. Um, I could see how art was being restricted um, by a kind of the idea of commodification. I could see as much as music had the music industry or film had this kind of industry it had to answer to. And I was very interested in, in trying to create a project where we could go straight to the source and we could really work with the men and women who are creating. And, and I thought to myself, you know, how could I share with them, give them and empower them with a platform that, uh, that was disruptive, that was foreign, that they could use to create um, in situ. And I thought if I had something that was nomadic, something that could be moving and traveling, um, you know, maybe that could do several things. It could, it could awaken someone from the routine of being in the same city, the same neighborhood, the same patterns. Um, you would be dislocated, you'd be in motion, you would kind of pull that energy um, of experience and, and work with it. And the, you know, the other thing is I thought that, you know, if we could have something that's in motion and then when the motion stops, we could have happenings. Um, that could also be very interesting because we could collaborate with audiences and um, audiences which, you know, perhaps, um, would never encounter these artworks, artists, or musicians. Um, so long story short, I, I thought to solve this, I thought, how do I do this? <laughs> and, uh, but, but is the train I, almost kind of a, a, a romantic mean of transportation through the fact that it has faded out, you know, since the, the victory of the, of the car and the highway in American culture that has been so important? Actually, I mean, if you think of blues music or jazz music, the train was very much uh, present, you know, in lyrics or in song titles and so on. And even like in, in landscape painting of the late 19th century, the, the train was present, but it kind of faded, completely faded out of art. And I think it was really a surprise to, to have this comeback and to see how strong it could be as a, as a symbolic uh, movement also and connection. Well, I, I agree with you, but for me, it wasn't actually an attraction to the train. The train was a problem solving device. Initially, I started thinking about this idea of how could I get a number of people to be in motion at once? And how could we create something that was almost akin to a nomadic studio? Um, and I was thinking about different ways and means of doing this. And the train kind of appeared in my mind. And I thought, you know, we have this, like you said, Gianni, we have this kind of um, dormant, this kind of um, neglected system moving across the continent, this kind of rusted, discarded, um, you know, train tracks, train stations that are sometimes nearly derelict. And, you know, maybe we could use this, we could kind of co-opt it and reactivate it in a new way. And, you know, create this way where a journey would be kind of following these different, um, uh, almost veins and arteries in the American landscape, which were the, the rail lines. And um, I think that, that as we started to develop the project, it was very fascinating looking at the, um, the stations themselves, this kind of architecture, often from the 20s, 30s, 40s, like WPA era architecture, you know, and so many of these spaces were, um, were just kind of forgotten about. So, you know, you think to yourself- You use it as a foil eventually uh, to build a community. It's the, the core or the spine of the artwork is rather this community that you build it up and that, uh, yeah, that every station and every stop the train made it created a different tissue of interaction, of creation, of manifestation. And I'm really interested to hear from you, you know, because you started off as a video artist and, and you started to make your video installation more and more complex and also very central actually by adding, for example, sand to the floor and so on. 
But then at some point, it wasn't enough. And you cross the line by really integrating uh, living other creative minds. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, this moment? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think that uh, much of my early work was um, moving image based primarily. And, um, and with, with those works, with those installations, I was very interested in kind of um, breaking the screen, creating a situation where um, the viewer would kind of step inside, they would be immersed in the concept of the work, the experience of the work. And, um, and I think I was very um, interested in finding a way of breaking the formalism of the physical art that I saw, the object, the, the wall, on, the, the work on the wall, for example. And instead having something that was porous, it was liquid, that was changing continuously, that was choreographing around you. Um, and that was, that was a, you know, a, a very strong interest for me. And I think at a certain point, I, I was interested in, in also expanding beyond the screen and almost saying, you know, could you go into the screen and step inside it? And that kind of took me back into the physical world <laughs> for, for some of these projects. And, um, you know, I think uh, a piece like that, for example, might be um, the Sonic Pavilion, which is a work in um, uh, Inho team in Brazil. And the Sonic Pavilion is a, it's a, a circular glass pavilion on a kind of jungle hillside. And at the core of it is a hole that goes um, uh, approximately 700 feet into the earth. And there are sensors that pick up the sound of the earth's shifting and, and movement in that. And, and, and that for me was but very pivotal. If you look at, sorry to interrupt, but if you look at your early video work, you know, for example, the one you shot in Bollywood, basically you had the same amount of organization probably to find partners and, but they, they weren't, you couldn't see them actually in the film material because only actors were to be seen. But actually it's, it's a bit as if you would have expanded, you know, and, and go away from the staged view and, and actually taking away the camera to, mm -hmm. to stage something that is much more immersive and that is also a bit out of control to a certain extent. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But what, 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 was there a specific moment where you thought, so, okay, now I have to go further, you know? I mean, I cannot imagine how much work it is to organize a, a, an event like Station to Station, to convince all these people, to convince James Terrell to be part of this. How did you do this? Well, I think that, um, you know, to me, every, every project, every artwork is almost like a different kind of limb or branch on a tree. Um, you know, it's, it's, you find, you find you're drawn to projects for me that I'm, I'm drawn to things that, you know, often don't exist, or I'm not sure if I can find a way to make them come into reality. Um, and there is, there is, there is a kind of, um, a chess game involved, a kind of, a, a very, um, uh, personal set of obstacles sometimes. But I think when you kind of find yourself on these journeys, um, you can often find things that are unexpected, um, that are spontaneous. And there's an incredible energy there. And I think that oftentimes I find myself um, working on many projects at once, not one thing, but you know, maybe there's projects right now that are, will take five years or three years or, or things like that. And they're kind of ongoing and they're kind of these living systems. They're kind of around you all the time and you're kind of moving back and forth from one to another. And for me, that feels incredibly comfortable. Um, I, I, I don't work in a very linear way. Um, I, I probably should say I don't work very well in a linear way um, where it's just one piece and you're making it one step at a time and then you finish it. Um, I, I like very much this idea of different mediums. I like this idea of kind of a cross pollination where um, you're moving and circulating different ideas and stimuli in different ways. Um, oh, could I ask you on that little screen, could, could we just see each other? I see this um, picture forever is kind of sitting there. Um, so I think, that, I think that in a lot of ways, you know, that, that idea, the idea that you know, we, we're living in this moment in time where we have so much um, at our fingertips in terms of mediums, in terms of ways of working, um, you know, that a 12 year old can make a film on his iPhone or her iPhone and edit it and send it to someone 
you know, that, that 20 years ago would have required a huge amount of production. So I think that in a lot of ways, I, I, I just want to get back to that idea that, that I don't see singularity in mediums. I see that really um, it's the concepts that we work with, but the concepts can kind of, they can create paths into any medium or any form. And that, and that to me is just incredibly interesting. Do you think at all about, you know, single artists or contributors that exceeded your expectations? Or is it more like kind of a, a fog or, or an, an energy field, you know, that you created where the individual doesn't really sticks out anymore? I think, I think um, maybe, uh, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm answering the, your question correctly, but I think that really to me, it's almost as if each artwork is kind of a, a singular persona. It's a singular experience for identity. And, you know, when you're talking about Station to Station, I remember when that project was over and I remember kind of coming back to the studio and, you know, really being quite exhausted um, in every sense of the word. And, um, and that year, I just wanted to make sculptures. I just wanted to make objects that I can make alone in solitude. And, you know, it was a way of going in a completely different system. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the objects I made that year, um, if I were to fast forward 10 years later, informed uh, Mirage, this mirrored um, house sculpture, which uh, you'd mentioned is in the Swiss Alps. So yes. it's kind of strange Maybe should how- just... So sh should we move on to Mirage and look at the short sure, clip? Sure. I think that would be an interesting reference. So this is an image actually in the first location where you've created it. Let's start with the clip. So it seems to be almost in the tradition of, of the Californian case study house, but it's an artistic case study house. It's also interesting to see the house in the house now in, the, in, the, in Detroit. Actually, that was the second time I think it was shown. 
And I guess that when you uh, created this work, you had really the Californian desert in mind and, and this sideric landscape very close to the stars and this landscape that has been so important in the past 40 years, actually, uh, for, for a lot of American artists, for creation as an escape from, from an institutional frame and to go beyond like the idea of the institution. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more what was the spark to create this, this artwork and also how it alters. I mean, it's also a machine. It's a machine for seeing that really alters your perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I like what you just said, this idea of a machine for seeing or a kind of prism in a way. And um, I was, um, to address your thoughts on the, the form of the sculpture, I was you know, very much looking at that idea of this kind of banal, everyday suburban architecture, the kind of house that we've, you know, every one of us has passed hundreds of thousands of times and we forget to see it anymore. It's so, it's so um, pervasive uh, in the landscape. And I think that's true kind of almost in every country. And, um, and I, I, I wanted to take that form and kind of just remove, erase um, all the history of it, all any personality, any texture, and just let it become pure form. And, um, and you really kind of create a work that could merge with the landscape, that could disappear into the landscape, that could um, become like a lens that would allow you to see the landscape differently. And, um, and I think in a lot of ways, I, I wanted to create an artwork that was living in a sense. I mean, it has a lot uh, to do also with the perception of landscape and of this very specific landscape that is so raw and that is also actually almost a foil for the sublime. I mean, it's interesting to see the, the whole uh, evolution from uh, the sublime, for example, in the work of Barney Newman to a more technological sublime. For example, if you think of James Turrell, who's certainly a very important artist also for you, it's interesting to see that actually he, he neutered his art a lot also through this art and technology program that he was in, that uh, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art did. And he was uh, working with Garrett Aerospace, where they tried to simulate the, the sensory deprivation that astronauts would have in outer space. And uh, eventually dropped out of the program because he thought that was, everything was way too literal. And he, he looked for a more poetic approach actually to, to the same phenomenon. And, but you can tell that the cons felt Charlie that they used in these experiments in the lab. It's, it's somehow um, the DNA of his artwork. And it's, it's interesting that you go back into nature, you know, and that you kind of find a new sublime. I mean, the mirage, I guess, can be compared also to sublime because a mirage has also something scary. It's something that you see, but you are aware that it's non-material, but you see it clearly and you perceive it as, as more than just an appearance. And can you tell a bit more, do you have any interest in this idea of, of, a, of a new sublime or, or to play around with, with those ideas? Well, I think one of the ideas that was at the core of um, a project like Mirage and some of the other more recent works that are kind of in the landscape um, is I found that I was interested in kind of a return to the real. Um, this idea that um, our, our days, our hours, our minutes are, um, so consumed by screen time um, that we kind of almost have this, these two parallel realities, um, the screen life and the physical life. And, you know, I found that, that the more I would slow down and the more I would really look at where I was and what I was surrounded by, there was something very kind of powerful about that, that I had almost uh, learned to neglect. And I was interested in using art as a tool, a kind of a way to drive a wedge in reality and to really allow you to focus again on the present. And I think a piece like Mirage kind of looks at that. It looks at this idea of, you know, what do you see in the work? I mean, the, the work really has no color. It has no surface. It has 
nothing formal to it. It's simply the, the movement and geometry and the way it kind of uh, sucks in the landscape like a black hole or it pushes out um, abstraction. And how that changes all the time was really what I was interested in. Not creating a fixed piece, but creating artworks that were um, embracing change. But to a certain extent, you could also say that just like the astronauts, you know, like today's, uh, today's people who use like all these screens have also faced a kind of sensory deprivation. But what is interesting is that on one hand, you, you lure them into this sideric landscape, but on the other hand, you, you prepare like um, an experience that is that's very much in sync with the full immersion, you know, that has been one of the, the most extreme uh, strings of evolution, actually also in the art. Uh, if I think of people like Stan van der Beek uh, up to VR works of today, you know, it seems to be somehow related also with digital reality, with tiling of uh, Photoshop programs or other uh, kind of CAD programs. And, and with these illusions, you know, that, that seem to be also a bit related to the mirage. You know, um, just to speak of another project, and um, do we have images of the underwater pavilions here we could? Um, yes, we them? do. The, the only thing is like time-wise, we ah. have only time, I think, for one more artwork and probably a lot of DC folks are expecting some, <laughs> okay. some one insights. But, but very briefly, why don't you go into the underwater pavilions. I just wanted to mention this one thing, because for me it was like really an incredible awakening. But um, we see this image here. Uh, this is one of three um, installations created under the Pacific Ocean. And you know, we worked on this. Um, you know, the, the piece was finally there. We had anchored it to the ocean floor. And, um, and I went out on this island. It's December, the water is cold. I put on my scuba tank and I um, sank, I sank under the ocean through these kelp beds. And, you know, when you dive into this moment of, of disbelief where you're suddenly breathing artificial air and, and all of a sudden, you know, I had this kind of panic, sinking, breathing air, and all of a sudden this liberation. And as I was dropping down and down and down into the ocean, I could see this installation in the distance. And I could see the light shimmering off it. And I could see kind of these schools of sea life just passing me by in this completely democratic way, like, like I was just nothing. And, and I had this moment where I thought, this is so out of body. It's so incredibly foreign. Everything around me goes against everything that I'm familiar with. And is there a way that the digital world could ever even touch this? No. And at that moment, I kind of reached down and I brushed my hand across a rock. And there was a, it was an abrasive of rock with barnacles. And I could feel my finger just almost kind of cut. And that moment, I just thought to myself, if there's a way that we can work with different forms of art, if art can kind of activate and thrust us back into the moment, into reality, then there's something there. There's something there that, that maybe this pursuit of the simulacrum, this pursuit of the artificial um, is only one tiny direction, but maybe we really need to look back at uh, what is around us. And, um, and with that, let's, um, let's look at song one. Great, thanks for the, for the insights. Yes, let's move on to song one and let's look at the clip first. I mean, you, you I think instead of Q and A's, we thought of having someone and to stop time at 9 p.m. That is 3 p.m.
You are here, and so am I. Maybe millions of people go by, but they all disappear from You once said a great pop song enters your body and never leaves it. <laughs> so I think it's interesting. We have uh, started with uh, Station to Station, which was created just after Song One, mm. if I'm right. Yes. And, and I think both of them draw, but I think in very different ways from, from pop music and maybe from an ideal that lived in pop music very strongly in the 50s and 60s and that, uh, that disappeared almost. Like this, this idea of inclusion, of sharing a, a utopia, like a place that doesn't exist, but that you can sense and that you can uh, live through. So 
Tell me a little bit more about your vision of song one. I mean, of course, there was, was there first the building or first the song? Yeah, it was, um, uh, can we just go back to looking at Johnny, please? Thank you. Um, I, I think that for, for me, you know, it, it, was, it was interesting. You know, I had been speaking to the Hirshhorn about doing something and I, I went to DC and I, um, I took a taxi to the museum and uh, opened up the taxi door and I saw the building. And I, I'd never really focused on the building before. And I saw it and, and this kind of wide aspect ratio. And I just, at that second, I just saw that there was going to be a work there. I just saw that that, that just, you know, was the space that was, you know, it was, it was incredible and it could be activated in this way. And I thought about this idea of the material. The material of the building is obviously, it's concrete. It's, Think Gordon Bunn shaft. It's a kind of a, uh, a late period brutalist architecture, and I thought about this idea that that, that this space is um, you know it's very heavy. It's very um, kind of monumental, and I thought, what if it could become liquid? What if it could suddenly become porous and liquid, and it could could have um, a narrative that kind of just moved and changed across it? But I really didn't know what the work would be, and. Um, after a few months, I was kind of working on ideas, and I think I had you know, 80 or 100 ideas at one point, like just too many. And um, the holidays came, and everyone left the studio, but I stayed there alone. And I would, I, I love music, and I would just find a piece of music, and I would just put it on repeat all day. And um, and I knew that no one was around, so I, w I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't bother anyone, you know, if with this like loud repeating sounds. And at a certain point I thought about it, I thought, I thought it's so interesting because what I'm hearing is never the same. The song, the exact same three minute song, whatever it was, I would always hear different parts of it or it would disappear or something would come into the foreground. And I thought about the idea of repetition and human perception and how we think we see the same thing, but we never do. Every moment we're moving forward, we're moving forward and we're reinterpreting differently, we're pivoting. So I really kind of also got- with the song, you have again, kind of a synesthetic dimension as very often in your work, because you have these amazing voices that they only sing about visual phenomena, you know, that they only have eyes, which yeah. I think is very interesting because it creates yeah. like this twist between hearing and seeing, which of course, both elements are very strong and predominant within, within song one. Yeah. And, and in the end, with the piece that you, you see there, um, I think it's about 45 minutes in whole, it's uh, 360 degrees. Um, but in the end, what we ended up doing was, was we remade the song over and over and over, different variations, different musicians, different collaborators from, you know, a sly guitarist from Texas that we found to, uh, I think Beck actually um, made four versions of it. He rented the Beach Boys studio from the 60s and, um, and, and did these kind of like musicians versions. that without you would never have played together, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and it became this kind of montage, this kind of this single small three minute piece of music kind of exploding and expanding. But, but, but that was really kind of, um, that was one component. And the other component was really the idea of the narrative. And I was interested in, in really, um, uh, creating a work that dealt with the modern world, a modern landscape, the idea of the individual now and the present, and kind of how we occupy the world around us, the urban space. And I was thinking about how to do this, how to kind of have a narrative thread that could take you from person to person. Um, and it wouldn't be too disruptive. You wouldn't kind of lose the viewer. So these ideas kind of converged, this idea of repetition, this idea of this one song, um, it was, you know, originally written for a soundtrack for the movie Dames, I think in the 1920s for a, a Busby Berkeley scene. And, 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 and then kind of looking at this, this modern space that we occupy and, and kind of asking oneself, you know, how, how do we synchronize with the world around us? You know, moments that were desperately left behind and other moments where we're kind of, kind of completely merging with everything around us at once. But how about this message of unity, you know, that becomes very strong. Also, it's not a duet of two people who only have eyes for each other, but it's much more. It seems to be almost yeah. like a part of society 
yeah. that, that, is, that is almost in love with each other in a way that they have a great, maybe more in love with music and what, what music can represent. But it, it really feels like a, a union, you know, very different uh, uh, groups of people. And did you see it? I mean, you, you described it as an audiovisual spectacle. And of course, it's a spectacle. It's very spectacular. But do you, do you see also an underlying message of unity? Very much. I think, I think, there is, I think the work is really kind of exploring this, this kind of invisible connective tissue um, from person to person. Um, the way it kind of moves from, you know, someone inside a car alone to, you know, someone at a bus stop outside. And it kind of it creates this um, fabric where everything um, is, is, I think, shares. And um, I, I want to just mention one other thing that was very interesting about making this work was, you know, when you are, are working on filmic projects, um, for me, you can only make so much of a roadmap or only so much of a script. And then, you know, there's a lot of it really happens with improvisation. And, um, you know, it, it took us a very long time to film this. It was very grassroots. We were just out there um, shooting every night, one scene to another. And there was a moment where I really had this idea for a specific person. Um, you had I a think, studio in LA where you invited all the people over? No, we, a lot of it was shot just on location, um, just in, in places. Um, you know, a little bit at our studio, but, but what I was going to say was, was, was in, in my mind, I could see this woman, I could see this woman who was a certain age, who had a certain kind of um, character to her. And I was struggling trying to find a person who would kind of fit this vision. And I didn't find anyone. And it was like a week that I was uh, <laughs> searching. And I started to get insomnia. I kind of, in my mind, I kept thinking about the face of this, of, of, of this woman, the sound of her voice. And so I, I couldn't really sleep. And I, I, I walked out early one morning to a little cafe around here. And I walked up to the cafe to, to get a drink. And uh, there was a tree stump. And the woman was sitting there. And she was the exact woman in my mind. And she was sitting there drinking a coffee. And I just, I just walked over to her and I said, can you sing? And she said, in the shower, baby. And uh, I said, could you sing the song? And I told her the song. She said, I think I know that one. I said, could I pick you up later today and you could sing it for me? And I could take you to this parking lot and we could sing it at dusk. And, and, and there were all these moments in the work that were like that, where they were kind of improvisational. We would actually just find people and they would become part of the artwork, you know? And, and I, th I, I really, you know, I really, for me, there was something kind of, magical about that how it wasn't premeditated but there's more of this kind of flow this continuous flow through the work and i think that is kind of um i think that's kind of in the work when you see how it moves very um seamlessly how about the cut of the film i mean how do you cut a projection for 360 degrees and how do you anticipate movements and and rhythms and flows i thought a lot about uh, dance and choreography. And I thought about how choreography is in the round. Every viewer sees dance from a different perspective. And I thought if I could film and edit this work where one person, for, for example, see the work and they could see a, a man standing, you know, on a street corner on one side of the Hirshhorn. And if someone else at that same time could see uh, a woman standing on another street corner on the opposite side of the building, those people would never see the same thing twice and maybe never make that connection. But to me, it was very interesting that, that different people could be empowered, different viewers could see different versions of the work that way. And it was really kind of something where, where cinema was no longer a flat screen, but it was something to be discovered, to be empowered. Just like a live event or just like station to station where every viewer has a different angle to the story and, and another experience. I think so. So, I mean, you spoke a lot about failure and how you learn from failure and how failure brings you into situations where you have to rethink the base of your project and where eventually you find the right solution. But is there also a way for you to define success? I mean, Sang Wan seems to be a very successful artwork, but how is it successful for you? Well, I think 
in a lot of ways, kind of artworks complete themselves. Um, there's, there's not really a premeditated point where you think, you know, this artwork is going to be done at this point. The artwork kind of finishes itself. It becomes hermetic and it kind of seals you out and it starts living its own life. And um, yeah, I think with song one, it was, there was just a point where the, the work was no longer mine. It was kind of living on its own. And I think that's when it, it went away from me and it kind of opened in Washington. And um, I was, uh, I have to say, I was incredibly grateful to the Hirshhorn. And, um, and I was incredibly grateful to the people of DC because I, for me, it was a tremendous risk. I had no idea how a work like this would be um, uh, received. And, um, and I, I was surprised how it became very grassroots, how people would just grab a blanket and lie in the grass and watch it or bring a friend or I could see cars kind of double parked and people like, you know, watching it from their, their vehicle. And, and, you know, people would stop me. They would say, you know, I, I jog down the space every night, you know, after work. And now I slow down and I watch. And, you know, to me, that was really, um, that, that spoke to the potential of art when art kind of makes you see the world differently and it kind of allows you to kind of uh, reconstruct things in a way which is unique and foreign that wasn't there before. So I, I'm incredibly, thank, thank you all, anyone who's on this. <laughs> I think it was definitely a win-win situation for, for the museum, for you, and for, for the public. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic artwork. Maybe a last question. I mean, you mentioned in the beginning that you thought about new ways to create art, like non-material ways, uh, landscapes, and so on. Is there a crazy project that you can share with us like, that is stuck in your head and, and you just think so <laughs> one day? There, there will be the opportunity to do it. Well, um, I could probably tell you more in a few months, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I just want to kind of talk about this moment that we're all in for just one second before we, we complete this. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we're, we're in a situation which is unprecedented when you think about it. I mean, this is an international moment. It's not a war. It's not two nations fighting with each other. It's, it's a moment of, of reflection of the society we've created, who we are. And perhaps we can use this moment to really kind of ask ourselves, where do we want to go from here? What choices do we want to make? What decisions should we make? And, um, and I think that this is, this is like a very important moment of, of, of awakening if we make it one. And I think that also within that, I think creativity and culture plays a huge, huge space because culture is, the intangible. It's the space where there's possibilities. It's, it's a space for philosophy, for, for abstraction. And I think that, that we need this nourishment that culture can give us more than ever. So um, I think we're, we're all in that, to speak of uh, communal, I think we're all collectively in this. And, um, and you know, we, we need to really kind of um, make the most out of this. I totally agree. But Doug, we're over time. It was okay. fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope to speak to you soon in, in, in real, real person facing real person. But in the meantime, I think it was really enriching and very interesting. And I thank you very much. Yeah, with pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.